Hey, this is David Papa, the personal injury guru. And on today's show, we're going to have orthopedic spine surgeon, Dr. Ragab. He is also the founder and owner of CSI, which is Comprehensive Spine Institute, and their surgical center. And he's going to come on the show today, and he's going to talk a little bit about the differences between static x-ray, MRI, and CAT scan, so you know the differences. He's also going to talk about different injections for different injuries. He's also going to point out with demonstrative aids um, and also on um, his laptop, different types of injuries to the discs, such as bulges, herniations, and extrusions. All three of them will be talked about. And um, you might want to watch this on YouTube um, to see the podcast that we're, we're doing right now because the demonstrative aids that he's using are much better off if you see it visually. But he's going to describe all these types of injuries and, you know, all these remedies. And um, we should have a, a real good understanding by the end of today's lesson on exactly what happens when you have these injuries. And that's my goal is to give that to you. Uh, education is important, especially when you're talking about, you know, serious injuries to your spine. Um, so we'll see you back shortly on The Personal Injury Guru. This is the Personal Injury Guru Show with attorney David Papa. Welcome back to the Personal Injury Guru. I am David Papa, and I am here uh, with my guest, who is Dr. Agab, and he is the founder and uh, owner of CSI, which is Comprehensive Spine Institute, and they also have an excellent surgery center, uh, as you might have heard from, uh, from Nurse Mandy. And at this time, uh, I'd like Doctor to introduce himself. How you doing, David? And thank you for having me on the um, this show. Um, thank you. It's a pleasure and an honor. Um, I'm Dr. Ragab, and I am a spine surgeon, orthopedic spine surgeon, and um, I practice in Clearwater, Florida. I've been there for about ten years right now. Okay, and just maybe for the benefit of uh, everybody out there, uh, what is an orthopedic surgeon? What do you do? What's what's the study of orthopedics? The study of orthopedics is dealing with anything that involves the bones, whether it's a, a, a trauma or a fracture, um, arthritis, um, degenerative conditions, conditions that we get as we age. And of course, the spine is made out of bone and nerves. Right. And so we deal with the bony aspect of it. Okay. And to start with, what I'd like to do maybe is um, talk a little bit about the spine. And if you could use the demonstrative aids, just let everybody know what we're looking at with that with that demonstrative aid as far as the the discs and the uh, and the bony structures and, and the vertebrae and all that. If you could kind of give us a little lesson on that, that'd be sure. nice. Um, this is an example of a whole spine, um, as you're seeing here. Um, the pelvis is down there, um, and then we have three parts to the spine: the neck area, and then the thoracic or the chest area, and then the lumbar or the low back area. And every segment, I'm going to use this model right here to try to explain what every segment is made out of. Um, so as you see, and these are the nerves coming down from the brain all the way down, all the way down to the tailbone. And at every level, two nerves come out of the spine. You can see them maybe better on this view. Um, and every one of these nerves, if it's the right side of nerves, they go to the, either the right arms or the right legs. If it's the left side nerves, they either go to the left arms or the left legs, uh, depending on where they're coming out. So in the neck area, the, they, uh, these nerves um, feed the arms. In the low back area, these nerves feed the uh, legs. Um, what happens is these nerves connect to each other. So for example, four, five, or six of them connect to each other and they form the sciatic nerve all the way down to the leg. So if there's an injury to any of these nerves, what can happen is um, either paralysis or uh, tingling or numbness or weakness in the muscles or pain as like people will know about sciatica. Um, before we get into the nerve issues, there's, uh, these nerves are all surrounded with bony structures and those bony structures are to protect these nerves. Um, it's, it's a very good uh, protective layer. You can't protect the nerves more than bone. But sometimes what happens is between these bones is this gelatinous material right here, 
and that is the shock absorber between the bones. Every time we take a step or you're running, there's a little pounding right there. And that's to keep the shocks from the ground up. Um, it, it dissipates them. What happens is this, uh, this disc right here sometimes will rupture, and part of that disc will come out and push on the nerve, and that's a disc herniation which will cause uh, sciatica and will cause a lot of pain for the patients and sometimes weakness and paralysis. So that's the basic structure. There's the bony part, and then there's the disc part, the nerve part, and then there's in the back here the joints where there's motion right here, here and here, and these will, with age, will get arthritis and they'll cause bone spurs and sometimes those bone spurs will also pinch on these nerves causing, causing uh, sciatica. Okay, and, and for today's purposes, um, because I've been talking about automobile accidents and trying to um, educate people on how you handle these types of injuries from automobile accidents, I've heard of bulging discs, I've heard of herniated discs, I've heard of extruded discs. Right. Can you just kind of explain what they are? So the three types, uh, uh, bulging, protrusion, and extruded discs, they're all disc herniations, but to varying degrees. The mildest degree is the disc uh, bulging, and sometimes we see that in normal patients without any accident or injury. Right. Uh, protruding disc means the disc is pushed further out, and the envelope surrounding the gelatinous material, which is like a jelly on the inside of this red structure, um, the jelly on the inside is protruding out because the wall has weakened and there's a tear in it. It's called an annular tear. And the third type is called an extruded disc where the disc will fall out and go inside the spinal canal. And it's completely detached from the original disc. That's the extruded. So the bulging and then the protruding, which can push on the nerves, and then there's the extruded, which detaches from the main disc and falls in the spinal canal. Okay, and obviously the extrusion is the worst possible scenario for that type of a herniation. It is, yes. Okay, and um, when, you, when you first see a patient and you're examining them, uh, you have to rely on um, diagnostic testing, correct? Correct. And it, it just tell folks out there what types of diagnostic testing you use and why you utilize those particular tests. Right. Um, basically, there's three or four types of diagnostic tests. One would be the x-ray. Two would be the CAT scan, and three would be the MRI. And then there's other scans that can be done if you're suspicious of uh, other uh, pathologies. But we always start with an X-ray. The X-ray will show bone, but it'll also show the alignment of the spine. As you see here, the neck area, there's a little curve here like a C, and then it reverses in the thoracic area, and then in the lumbar spine again, and this is not connected correct, and in the lumbar spine, again, that C forms again like it is up in the uh, cervical spine. Um, so we look at the alignment. If that there's a reversal of this uh, C curvature, then we know there might be something injuring the ligaments or the muscles, causing stiffness of the uh, back and causing a straightening of that curve. Um, we look at the bones to look at there's, if there's a fracture or a dislocation. A dislocation can happen like it was on here where the de joints will detach from each other. And that would be pretty detrimental to the nerves because it can pinch on the nerves. And once the nerves are injured, if it's a complete injury, they're not gonna recover. Um, so that's the x-rays. We always get the x-rays front view and side view, uh, AP and lateral. And then um, sometimes we'll need flexion extension. Um, what that is is, for example, in the neck, we ask the patient to look all the way down and all the way up. And if they're able to do that, and um, without pain, that's great. If there is pain, um, it might be an indication that there's more of an injury. Um, we look at the x-ray, um, both in flexion and extension, and look for instability. If there's instability, it could very well be a fracture, because the instability means the vertebras are going to rock on each other back and forth. Um, and we don't want to see that ever, but if, it, it sometimes happens, and it's sometimes there. So that's the first modality, the x-ray. It's a very simple test. Right. Um, doesn't even take five minutes. Okay. The next test we, uh, we utilize is the MRI. And the MRI shows, it does show bone, but it's not necessarily a good um, study to show bone. The, the best study to show the bone is the CAT scan, where um, you see bone and you don't see the soft tissues. The MRI, you see the soft tissues and you don't see the bone. And when I say soft tissues, I mean the nerves, 
I mean the uh, ligaments, uh, the disc, uh, whether it's herniated or not, right. and all the surrounding soft tissues uh, as muscles as well. Okay, that's a great explanation because a lot of people sometimes don't know the difference between those tests. And just for the record, folks, when you're talking about MRI, a lot of people have trouble with claustrophobia, me being one of them. They do have MRI centers right. where you can go, and if you're claustrophobic, you can actually sit up in an MRI, and it just kind of ends right here, and you're wide open. Um, and there are other X MRIs where you can stand straight up, and everything in front of you is wide open. So you don't have to worry about being claustrophobic anymore. Although I believe it's probably the better skin is probably the one where you lay down and go in the tube. Is that right? Right. Yes. Um, there's two types of tubes that you lay down in, and there's an open one and a closed one. The picture from the closed one is better than the open one. Um, gives better resolution, better sharpness, um, okay. and it j shows things much better. Right. But just in case you can't do it, and you're like me, you have to kind of choose for the lesser quality so you can live through the exam. Otherwise, maybe you can get medicated. Yes, you can. <laughs> Usually we uh, prescribe uh, just one pill, or Xanax or um, Valium 40, 45 minutes before the procedure or the test, and it'll calm me down. Okay, very good. Yeah. All right. Well, that's that's awesome information. Now, I know that you brought with you on your laptop um, different um, pictures of herniations disc bulges, extrusions, things of that nature. Can you kind of go over those so people can actually see, um, you know, people's spines and what they actually look like when you get the results back? Sure. Let me start with um, with a picture comparing an MRI versus a CAT scan. And in that picture, um, you can see here on the right side, on the your on your left is the MRI scan and on the right is the CAT scan. On the CAT scan, you see the bone uh, bone blocks. In between is the disc, but you don't really see the disc itself because it's not supposed to show the soft tissues. You can see shadows of the soft tissue, such as the bowel right here, um, but it's mostly for the bones. So these are the spinous processes in the back. Those are the bumps that you feel with your fingers on down your spine, and then the nerve canal or the spinal canal is running down here where all the nerves are and then it's protected on the front with the bones and the discs. Um, so that's the CAT scan. On the other hand, the MRI, if you see it here on the left side, you actually see the nerves coming down here, which is this gray line all the way down here. You see the discs. You do see the shadow of the bone or the bones, um, but not as, as good as the CAT scan is. Um, Sometimes the bones will show uh, uh, inflammation in it or a bruising in it, so you know there might be a fracture there. Um, but ma mainly the cat, the MRI is shown is to see the nerves and the discs, right? And any other soft tissues. Okay, so when you look at that MRI, how do the discs look in that picture? They look great, and I'll show you a picture of a normal MRI, which we love to see and we always see in people um, less than 20 years old. Right here, you can see that this is a normal MRI. Um, these are the bone blocks, these squares right here. The nerves are running down here, okay? And these are the discs right here, here, and here. I hope you can see my the mouse. Um, but you can see here the discs here are somewhat gray or white right. at each and every level. And that means they're full of water. Um, they're well hydrated or full of water. And what it does is sort of like a, um, a water mattress and it protects the spine and it mm -hmm. absorbs the shock and everything because it's bouncy and it's um, uh, like a gelatinous material. Mm -hmm. As we age, or if there's an injury to the disc, what happens is the disc turns uh, black like it is here, and you can see right here the black, the black, and it thins out too. Um, and that's why we get short as we age. We get shorter and shorter by about an inch or, or an inch and a half um, because these spaces are thinner and thinner. Um, so that's the difference between a normal MRI, which would be in a 20-year-old, versus a 40- or 50-year-old, which would look like this. And then you can see here, with the disc bulges and the arthritis, there's not as much space for the nerves as there are over here on the left side. And when you have that issue, that's what causes pain, and that can disrupt all the nerves and cause issues. Correct. It pinches on the nerves, causes pain down the legs, pain in the back, a lot, a lot of types of pain. Right. 
So that's not always from accidents. And as you get older, that can just happen naturally. Right. And my job is to distinguish um, what is from an accident and what is from normal aging. Okay. And it, what are the methods of doing that? Um, one is looking at the MRI and looking for areas where there's um, inflammation in the bone or, or a tear in the disc. All right. So, Doc, uh, perhaps you could show us a good um, slide of the herniation. Sure. Here, here it is actually right here. And um, as you can see, the nerves are coming down here in this slide. Again, this is an MRI, but right, these discs are healthy. This one, that one, and that one. But look at this one. First of all, there's a big bulge or protrusion. This is actually a protrusion uh, pushing out from the disc. And you can see this disc material has thinned out compared to these. See, these right. are thicker. This is thin. And it's because part of the disc has already come in the canal. And it's pinching on these nerves. So that's an example of a disc herniation, and the way to treat it surgically is to go in and just shave this part off. We don't want to lose anything from the inside, just shave this part off. And then this is another example, or, and you can see the same disc herniation here. Um, and another one right here with the disc herniation right here. See, these are all fine with plenty of space for the nerves, but this one will pinch on the nerves. Right, and that's what's causing people all of these complaints and all the symptoms. Right, and all these are disc protrusions. And, and to, to work with the, you know, as, as far as working with other doctors, if someone says to you, hey, I've got a problem with my back, you get an MRI result like that, wouldn't you kind of correlate clinically all that information together, all the medical records to determine also whether it was a new injury or an older injury? Yeah, yeah, we have to take everything into account, what the patient is complaining about, what the history is, what the surrounding um, issues are, um, what the history is, and what previous treatments the patients had uh, in the past uh, okay. to correlate it with, for example, an accident or car accident. Right. If the patient had never had the pain or was never treated for back problems and all the problems are now related to this looking uh, spine, then we know that there was an injury. Okay. Without even looking at this uh, MRI. All right, very good. Do you have any other slides that you'd like us to see? Yeah, sure. Um, there's another one showing the tears, annular tears. And for example, right here, that little tiny dot, that white dot right here, um, and right here. So this is lumbar vertebra number five, and this is sacrum, which is the tailbone. And the, so the disc, you see how it turns black? Yep. And that one turned black because there's an injury here and here. It could have been black prior to the injury. And because it's black, it's degenerated. It's never going to be as strong as the healthy ones. So it's easier to cause that tear in these degenerated ones. So it's more, you're more susceptible to injury if your disc is already um, degenerated. degenerated like right. that. It, it makes sense. Uh, something that's worn out is right. more susceptible to injury than a normal one. Okay. In a healthy health, because when people are in auto accident, sometimes they get a rear end collision, which isn't that bad, but they're already susceptible to injury because they've got degenerative issues. Correct. Yes. And that can cause an injury kind of easy, so it doesn't have to be a massive impact. Right. Correct. Correct. Because we get a lot of situations where people get into accidents, there's not a lot of damage, but they're complaining about terrible back pain. Right, right. And sometimes the MRI is not going to show anything at all. For example, whiplash injuries in the neck, yep. where the, um, you know, there's the sudden uh, extension and then flexion and then extension again, that causes an injury, not to the, not necessarily to the disc, it can to the disc, it can to the bone, but sometimes it's the ligaments and the muscles surrounding. Right. And you can't see that on the MRI, but the patient has pain, you're not even going to see it on flexion extension views. All you're going to see sometimes is straightening of that C curve that I showed you on the on the model, okay. um, but nothing on the MRI. Let's talk about some treatment procedures. Um, how do you treat that type of an issue when the MRIs come back and you're like, well, we don't see anything wrong with the, the, the disc and such, but they're having those ligamentous problems. What do you typically do for that? So there's two types of treatments. Actually, there's three types. There's conservative, non-invasive, where we, and we always start with this one, um, which is um, either chiropractic treatments, or physical therapy, and between the chiropractors and the physical therapists, there's a lot of modalities that are done. There's massages to loosen up the muscles, there's uh, ultrasounds, there's manipulations, um, there's a lot of uh, factors. And we go for a, you know, a period of four to six weeks, twice or three times a week, um, and if the patient is improving and improving, we keep going even more and longer because they're getting better. So why, right. why, if you have something good, why interrupt it? Right. Um, but if they're not improving, 
and you went four, six weeks and absolutely no improvement or things are getting worse, we tell the patient to stop the therapy mm -hmm. and let's look at something else. Something else would be looking at starting, starting to do invasive, such as shots, needles, um, and injections or surgery. Okay, and it's good that you mentioned that um, about chiropractic treatment in more passive uh, modalities before you go right to surgery. It's it's comforting to know that that's what you do. Right. It yes. really is, mm -hmm. uh, because I know that in the past I've seen um, some situations where people are pushed right into surgery. I kind of disagree with that. I like to see maybe something like you just said. If you're not sure, you know, let's take it slow. And surgery is a last resort. Correct. Absolutely. And, and that's awesome that you work with the other doctors, you know, working together to do that, even though they're outside of your practice. Right, right. Uh, most doctors don't do that, which is unfortunate. Some doctors don't. Right. I hate to say most, but some. Yeah, well, I can say most because I've worked well. <laughs> <laughs> but with you, we don't get that. What we get is somebody that genuinely cares about taking the conservative approach first and making sure that you can do everything before going into injections or surgery. Right, correct. That's very good. Okay. Um, what Also, um, I've seen people get what they call the RFAs, radio frequency ablations. Correct. Um, and I know that some people get recommended for it, and a lot of people just don't know what that means. Can you kind of explain all that? Um, yeah, of course. There's a small, tiny nerve that sits about right here in the, in the spine, and that nerve is responsible to take the pain signal from the disc and from the joints and sends it up to the brain. Okay. okay. So what we do is the patient has pain. They're not in, they failed physical therapy. They're not interested in surgery. A lot of people don't want to have surgery because right. a lot of people have heard horror stories about surgery. Right. And uh, so it's really, really difficult to talk to someone into surgery. Um, right. So what we do is, as opposed to surgery and, and physical therapy has failed, that little nerve that sends the pain signal to the brain, we try to interrupt that uh, cycle. And we interrupt it with giving a shot of anesthetic, a little lidocaine, marcaine, novocaine, what you have at the dentist. Mm -hmm. And we see if that helps. We give it one or two or three levels. And if that helps the pain, then we're able to uh, cut that cycle of pain. Okay. However, that numbing medicine is going to wear off, and the pain is going to come back. So to make it last longer, we put the we put a needle right there where the spot is where we injected, and the tip of this needle burns or it heats up, and it burns the nerve. People, you know, worry about the um, term burning the nerve because you don't want to burn a nerve ever. But this type of nerve, um, its presence is is not doing any good. It's doing more harm than good. So, and the thing is, this nerve will grow back. It takes about six to 18 months to grow back. So we tell the patients about a year, um, give or take. Okay. Um, and by the time it grows back, hopefully your body will have healed itself. If it doesn't, we can repeat this in a year. The whole procedure takes about five to 10 minutes. Um, and the patients walk out and, uh, you know, they'll be sore for about a few days. But after that, the pain is, is much and let, better. And let's talk a little bit more about that, Doc, because I know people are apprehensive about procedures. Um, when you do an RFA, uh, kind of take us through, you know, you arrive at the surgery center. What happens? I mean, are they, do they go to sleep? Do they, are they awake for this? What happens? So um, we, we have the capability of doing anything. Um, we can either do this procedure with the patient awake we, we give numbing medicine so they don't feel that ablation or the burning. Um, but it's absolutely fine and normal for the patients to be awake. My mother, 87, and she had it fully awake with no anesthetic at all. We do give some uh, topical anesthetic for the needle as it's going in. It's a cold spray. Um, but that's pretty much the only pain. Um, we also can put the patient completely to sleep. We have a very uh, conservative, very trustworthy anesthesiologist that will put our patients to sleep for those five or ten minutes that we need it. Um, and those patients are usually patients that are stressed about the procedure. Uh, they don't want to deal with it. They don't want to feel the pain. Or they have a phobia to needles. Wow. Okay. Um, those type of patients. That's me. <laughs> the other, yes, I know. <laughs> the other type of patient, which is in the middle, we give sedation, which puts yeah. the patient in sort of la-la land. Um, okay. They're comfortable. They're relaxed. They're awake. We're able to talk to them, but they're relaxed. Okay. 
All right, that makes sense. Yeah, I'll tell you because absolutely. that's a that's a good thing. <laughs> a lot of people out there. So if you're really apprehensive and you're not sure about uh, the injections or the RFAs, docs explain to you. They can make you very comfortable. They're very effective and they're pretty much pain free. Um, let's talk about the next thing, which is I want to talk about was ESIs. Right. Uh, can you explain what those are and how they help in in how you know what type of procedure that is? So the ESI, for example, if there's a nerve that's being pinched by this disc that's pushing on it in the back here, it causes inflammation because that nerve is moving and it's, every step you take that mer nerve moves a little bit and it rubs against that disc. It causes inflammation and that inflammation will cause a lot of pain. So what we do is with the needle we target this under fluoroscopy, under x-ray. Um, every uh, We advance the needle a little bit, take an x-ray shot, advance a little more, take an extra shot, all to make sure that we're in the right position. Until we get around the nerve, not in the nerve, but around the nerve, and we inject the dye to make sure we're in the right spot before we inject the medicine. Um, the medicine that we're injecting is a combination of cortisone and numbing medicine again. The numbing, numbing medicine is for the immediate relief of the pain. The cortisone will kick in, the effect of it will kick in in 24, 48 hours, um, sometimes three days. And what it does, it's the strongest anti-inflammatory. So it takes the inflammation away from the nerve. It helps. It helps a lot, actually. But the problem is it'll wear off. The rubbing is still going on, so inflammation can come back. Um, and it varies from one person or one patient to another how long it'll last. I get asked a lot, how long is it going to last? And I just can't answer that question because everybody's pain tolerance is different. Everybody's pinching degree is different on the nerve. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of factors. So... Some people will have relief for a week, or some people will have a relief for months. Okay, and is that the type of procedure where someone is laying down on their stomach and they're put to sleep? Again, same thing. It can be awake and it can be asleep, okay. or it can be with just sedation. It just depends on the individual yes. and their tolerance. Exactly. Okay, that makes sense. Um, what I want to talk about as well is in the if all else fails, and we're talking about surgery, starting say with the um, with the cervical, the neck. Um, what types of surgeries? I know that there's a laminectomy. I know that there's an ACDF. Could you kind of describe what each of them do and why we do those types of surgeries on people? Yeah, of course. Um, so we reserve surgery for patients that don't get better with therapy. We don't, they don't get better with the injections. Um, even if they do get better, for example, with the uh, ESI or the epidural steroid injection where we inject the cortisone, um, if the pain comes back in a week, it doesn't make sense to keep injecting every week because the cortisone or the steroid has side effects. Right. So at some point, um, the decision is made between myself and the patient, and we talk about it, and um, they realize they're not getting better, and they will agree to surgery. And the laminectomy that you asked about, Yes. all it is is there's pinching on the nerve, um, and we want to take that pinching off of the nerve. So we go in, take a little bit of this lamin off, this bone, a little, little, just a little piece of it, um, and we're getting the instrument in there all the way down to the nerve, and we make sure everything around the nerve is clear. If there's a piece of disc pushing on the nerve, we cut that off. We don't take the whole disc off, just the piece that's pushing on the nerve. If there's bone spurs from arthritis, we clip those off as well. Okay. Until the nerve is completely free and the patient will wake up all his leg pain is gone, his or hers. Well, it sounds like uh, certainly that the uh, the surgical recommendations that do happen, you can you can cure people that way. You can fix them. Yes, I'm very happy. Good. And we've had nothing but success working with you. My patients absolutely said your whole staff is amazing. They love uh, everybody over there. Uh, you've got great bedside manners, <laughs> which is good. <laughs> Uh, I, well, there's not a lot of doctors that have great bedside manners. It's always been a complaint. Yeah, but right. everybody says everybody in your office has great bedside manners. That's important for comfort and confidence in a patient, right? right. right? And uh, I certainly appreciate you showing up today, and you've explained everything. And uh, I look forward to, of course, working with you in the future. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Doc.